welcome to the West End Citizens Association Candidate Forum. I am Susan Prince, President of WECA, and I'm pleased to be hosting this event. The West End hosts a candidates forum every election season, and we are honored and excited to have been selected to have our forum on Rockville's Channel 11. Before we get started, I'd like to thank the candidates for coming out tonight and making themselves available to answer questions from our residents. We solicited questions from residents both within the West End as well as throughout Rockville, and we had a tremendous response. We had so many great questions. Um, some of them were on similar topics, and so we've worked hard to um, acclimate or, or uh, um, uh, put some of the questions together. So if you don't hear your exact question, we're trying to make sure we cover all the topics. Um, before um, joining us tonight are both mayoral candidates, Phyllis Marcuccio and Peter Gajewski. Phyllis is seeking re-election as mayor, and Peter is currently serving as council member. Also joining us tonight are candidates running for city council. There are eight candidates running for four positions on the city council, including incumbents Bridget Newton and Mark Pershela. Les Francis, Rich Godfrey, John Hall, Tom Moore, Virginia Onley, Dion Trahan are the additional candidates. Moderating tonight's event is Don Hadley, a longtime West End resident, Rockville attorney, and member of the Planning Commission who has graciously agreed to moderate tonight's debate. We're lucky to have such a distinguished moderator for tonight's event, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to Don and get our event underway. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. That's almost impossible to live up to, so we'll just move on. <laughs> we, we have some uh, requests for civility of the audience tonight. Not that you're not civilized to begin with, but we ask you to hold your applause until the end of the mayoral session, until the end of the council session, respectively. We ask you to not be demonstrative in terms of signs or spitballs or whatever your idea is. And uh, that request doesn't apply to the folks in the home audience. You're free to uh, be more liberated in the matter. Um, we... In addition to the questions that have been submitted, uh, there's still opportunity for those of you here in the audience. And also, there's an overflow seating outside in the hallway with a monitor. And for folks out there, we have three by five cards. If you'd like to signal Sabrina right here, she will pass a card and a pen to you, and you can pass back to her a question. And um, if it's legible, it will probably be submitted to the candidates. Uh, in our mayoral session, which is first, 35 minutes, and we propose the format of two-minute opening remarks, and uh, we'll signal you uh, when there's time of four minutes left so that you each can make two-minute closing remarks at the end. The actual response time for questions that we request that you honor is one minute, only one minute. And, of course, part of that depends on the quality of the questions that we are going to submit to you. But if you will honor that, that will be considerate of not only your form but of the other candidates' forms as well. Uh, we'll alternate starting um, alphabetically with Mr. Gajewski. And so you're on notice. You can start your motor running. And um, the, the format will be that uh, for the candidate who is initially questioned, then there will be a, a, a uh, one-minute uh, response, not response, but additional time for the other candidate to answer the same question. And then back to the original candidate. So in this case, if we started with you, Mr. Gajewski, you would then have an additional 30 seconds for a further response and so forth. So every, every other time, the favored questioner gets more time than the other, but we hope that balances out. The uh, timing is going to be rendered by Sarah, who's sitting in the front row with uh, flashcards. And uh, they don't, if you get signaled, that means with the yellow, that doesn't mean you're out of the game for soccer enthusiasts. It means that you have 15 seconds remaining in your time. And then she will signal you again at the end of your one minute time. And we just ask you to respond to that, if you will. We will have similar rules for the uh, council. Um, participants, and I think we'll defer giving their rules until they're here and can concentrate and be seated to hear those. Without further ado, uh, first question, Mr. Gajewski. 
This, it, is, it, this is just like the first first debate. Jim Maranin also forgot there's an opening statement. <laughs> Didn't you give it? I... <laughs> Yes, Jim told me to do this, actually. Yeah, okay. <laughs> very good. Okay. I apologize. <laughs> Opening statement, Mr. Gajewski. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you, Weka, for, uh, for hosting this event. I'm very much looking forward to answering, uh, answering your questions. A little bit about me. I reside with my family in Rockville, obviously, for the last seven years at King Farm. Uh, and uh, for five years before that, I lived in Twinbrook. Um, my wife Tisha is here, can introduce her. Hi Tisha. Uh, also my father, uh, Richard, uh, lives in Ingles Ingleside as of two years ago. He relocated from Southern California. There's, there's my dad. Uh, we have three kids. Uh, Michelle and Devon have both graduated from Richard Montgomery High School. Uh, our daughter Charlie is in fourth grade and I know we'll be talking about school overcrowding so I want to make sure everyone knows this up, up front. Charlie is in a portable classroom this year, and we don't like it. I am music director of the National Philharmonic at Strathmore, and a shameless plug, next week I have a pair of concerts, an old Beethoven program, I invite everyone. The National Philharmonic offers free admission to all kids, so please, please come. Uh, our favorite thing to do every year is to play for all second graders and fifth graders in, uh, in Montgomery County, uh, obviously including Rockville kids. So we've already done our fifth grade show this year, but we, uh, our second grade show is coming up uh, in November in a few weeks. So if you have a second grader in school, they will be coming to see me at, at Strathmore. Uh, tell them to wave, uh, wave to me. Uh, I am proud uh, that I was endorsed by the Gazette newspapers yesterday, uh, and I've also been endorsed by the Fraternal Order of Police uh, just a, a few days ago. Um, I'll talk about that perhaps uh, some more later. Uh, and my colleagues on the council, John Britton and Mark Prashela, and I look forward to our conversation this evening. Thank you, Mr. Gajewski. Ms. Marcuccio. Well, good evening, friends, relatives, neighbors, citizens of Rockville. We just sped here, and I meant we were speeding, from the White House. <laughs> I spent the day at the White House, and I actually, I don't want to wash my hand. I actually got to shake Mr. Obama's hand. It was very special. He was, uh, he was speaking to those of us who are part of the League of Cities, <clears throat> and as maybe you already know, but I have uh, served now twice on the board of directors of the Maryland Municipal League, a very important uh, location for the city to be involved. The Maryland Municipal League helps to set policies in Annapolis that have an impact on the 157 different municipalities in this city. It's incredibly important that the city of Rockville be part of this and active with it. I not only serve on that board of directors, but I'm on the board of directors of our, ca our chapter of the Maryland Municipal League here in Montgomery County. But I have to tell you that, of course, I've lived in Rockville since 1942. My father was a small businessman, so I have a great affinity for that. My sister is in the audience, and my niece. <laughs> And <clears throat> Rockville means a great deal to me. It's been my home for as long as I can remember. I'm a Richard Montgomery High School graduate. I went to Bucknell University. I got a graduate degree from uh, George Washington University. I've been a science educator for 38 years. Uh, it's so nice to know, even though I retired in 1999, we are now working on a science center for Rockville. I know you know about that because I've been working on Science Day for 20 years. Some of the, uh, the, the board of directors went to the Aztec meeting, Aztec being the Association of Science and Technology Centers, one of the groups I worked with. And it was so nice to when they came back from that meeting, they were so excited about Rockville being involved in a science center enterprise, but they knew me. <laughs> and that was kind of special. It's like my other life. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marcuccio. <laughs> now, first question. Uh, to Mr. Gajewski, is there an appearance of improper influence when an elected official votes upon an application or matter brought before the city by a contributor to his or her campaign? 
Well, uh, the first question, and, and, and well worth the wait. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, is there an appearance of inference uh, of, of influence? Is that is, is, Every, is there an appearance of improper influence? When an elected official votes upon an application you know, or a matter, you know that, that's something that everyone has to answer for him or herself. Uh, is there influence? No. Is there an, is there a potential for appearance of influence? Uh, I suppose, but that's an that's an individual decision. Uh, I wouldn't claim to know for for any one person. I know that I receive contributions. Mayor Marcuccio receives contributions. I can't imagine that she does the bidding of people who contribute to her. Mr. Hadley, I understand you contributed a hundred dollars to her campaign, and your wife contributed a hundred dollars to her campaign. And I can't imagine that she would go and do your bidding because of it. Whatever it is, I think she's an honorable person. So whatever the appearances are, uh, I can't speak to. But I think the important thing is that there isn't influence. The amounts are trivial. Let's agree. Let's agree about that uh, to begin with. So you know, that's uh, that's my best answer to the question. If anyone feels that there is real influence, then, uh, then you know, the, you need to vote for the other candidate or something like that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gajewski. Ms. Marcuccio. May I answer the same question? Please. Right. Would you like it repeated? Um, no. <laughs> I think I got the gist of it. Um, there was one issue which I really felt was kind of interesting in our last meeting. Mr. Gajewski made a <coughs> big thing about how he was going to recuse himself from voting on two different, three different items we had on the agenda that dealt with election law changes. And he didn't feel it was right for him to get involved with it. Well, when it came time to annex Silverwood, where his, some of his contributors have a vested interest, he didn't feel it was necessary to recuse himself then. I found that kind of unusual. If it had been in, if it had been my case, I would have recused myself from all of it if I have felt I was perhaps maybe going to be even accused of having taken um, f monies from others that might gain by some decision he would make. I would say that's the question I would ask. Um, I have to say I, I have to hope that anyone that has contributed to my campaign doesn't see me as being, you know, particularly in one pocket or the other. Thank you. Mr. Gajewski, 30 seconds. Sure, absolutely. Uh, about, uh, about Silverwood, it would be absolutely inappropriate for me to recuse myself on that vote. I'm elected to make those decisions. I've received $700 in contributions from not the developer of Silverwood at this point, uh, although I, you know, I hope he gives me money. Uh, I haven't re reported any yet, but so I hope he gives me money but uh, from attorneys that represent him. Now, I have a higher interest in Silverwood. I live three blocks away. My property value will be affected by thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars. Tens of thousands, seven hundred dollars. So, if I had any self-interest, I voted that. Thank you, sir. Next question to Ms. Marcuccio. Have you read the report of the White-Tailed Deer Task Force? What do you think of its recommendations? Do you favor culling the herd? Well, I think I've been pretty clear on my position. Uh, as far as the deer are concerned, there is a problem. I don't have any problem identifying the fact that we've got to do something. There is, however, a lesson or two here. Whenever you want to take out an animal or anything, you have to think about what is that going to teach the children? in your city. If something is not comfortable and you don't like what it's doing, you take a gun out and shoot it? I don't think that's the lesson we want to teach children. I think we have to look at this whole issue from the point of view of what are the alternatives, what are the possibilities. Maybe they don't all work. But one thing is for certain, I cannot see the sense in actually taking a bunch of deer out in one place and, and murdering them. That, to me, is absolutely out of the question. Mr. Gajewski. Yeah. Well, on, on this issue, uh, the mayor's position and mine are, are absolutely identical. Um, I also have spoken out against uh, the shooting of deer in Rockville. Our, maybe arri we arrive at that, uh, at that point uh, 
from, uh, from different perspectives. Uh, first of all, I mean, let me say that uh, just for anyone not in the know, that Montgomery County does do this uh, on, on a regular basis. Uh, so we are talking about whether in Rockville we want to carve out uh, a safe ha haven for, for deer if you want. Uh, so they can, they can come here and, and, and they will not be destroyed if they find themselves with, within the limits of, of our city. Uh, where I come at this is for us to expand legal uh, discharge of firearms in the city of Rockville uh, is just completely foreign to me. I'm completely against any such notion. It, it, it could potentially be dangerous. Uh, it, it just flies in the face of uh, you know, every, everything I believe in terms of, uh, in terms of firing guns. There, we, we, we had somebody at, uh, at Citizens Forum who suggested he would shoot him in his yard uh, had he had a gun. And you know, we can't go there. Ms. Mercuccio. You have a 30 second. Well, I, I suppose we're not in opposition here. <laughs> Save the time. Okay. The deer have a chance. There we go. <laughs> okay, Mayor Marcuccio. Who did we start with last? I'm already confused. Who's, whose turn? Okay, Mr. Gajewski, thank you. All right. Do you think that Citizens Forum is an effective way? for citizens to communicate their views to the mayor and council and the wider community. And what? And the wider community. Uh, yes, it's, it, it is an effective way for citizens to communicate with, uh, with the mayor and council. Citizens Forum, for those of you who don't know, is an op opportunity at every council meeting to stand before us for three minutes and speak to us. There is no, uh, there is no exchange. The only exchange comes at the end when uh, the council simply has a response to Citizens Forum. Citizens Forum is wonderful, but it is by far not the best way of communicating with, uh, with mayor and council members. Uh, the best way is one-on-one -on -one in a meeting uh, or in a town hall meeting. I've been holding town hall meetings quarterly since, uh, since I've been elected where we can actually have a discussion. I mean, a three-minute uh, moment to testify is very unsatisfying in that way because you, you get to speak your piece, but you don't get to get, uh, answer questions or ask questions. So it's, not, so it's a great way, but it's not the best way. Best way is one-on-one, -on -one, and I've been extremely available since I've been elected. Thank you. Just one reminder, I don't want either of you to disadvantage yourself. We're told by the television audio people that when you stand, you distance yourself from your mic. So you will certainly be understood if you want to stay seated so that you can be mic'd better. Should we stay seated or should we? Stay seated. Stay seated. All righty. Okay, Ms. Marcuccio. <laughs> How's that? That better? Yes. All righty. Well, <clears throat> Let's see, what were we talking about? <laughs> Citizens have, Forum. Citizens Forum. Oh, you know that's my favorite part of the meeting. That's when uh, we get to hear from citizens the good and the bad. You know, lots of times citizens come and tell us about what kind of things are going on in their neighborhood, what's going on in the city, what's exciting that's coming up, maybe even nearby. It's a tremendous opportunity to learn not only the council, but the people out there watching, they, uh, we've promoted the science cafes on there as, quick, as many times as I can recall. It is a tremendous way to see each other face to face. Uh, I don't think we've been as friendly as we might be to the citizens who've come up to Citizens Forum. You know, it ought to be an invitation. I've noticed that in the past maybe six months or so, there have been fewer and fewer people coming. Much of it has been uh, related to a agitated items. Uh, I'd like to see the citizens there more sharing what exciting things they're doing, as well as asking us for, for things that ought to be done. It's our way sometimes of learning about something that isn't done. Mr. Gajewski. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say the, the key here is that we need to be available. Um, and uh, we need to be widely available. Uh, I answer most of my own emails. Uh, I, I'm available by phone. Uh, you can, you, you know, people even have my cell phone number, frankly. It's, uh, it, it's, it's quite widely available. Uh, so uh, there needs to be a communication, but if a citizen has a problem, uh, the citizen's forum is not, not, the best, uh, not the best venue. Best venue is to pick up the phone and call me uh, or, or drop me an email. Thank you, sir. Next question is to you, Mr. Gajewski. Is that right? No. 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 
<laughs> See, I'm just seeing if you're on your toes, right? Do you know the answer? Okay. Okay. So, Ms. Marcuccio, yes, do you think that the mayor's powers and authorities relative to other council members are different, and do you think they should be changed in any way? Well, I believe our charter says that the mayor runs the meetings. I don't believe there is any other area that is particularly spelled out. But I can tell you, having served in this post for a couple of years, the mayor is different from the rest of the council. You are different because you have to attend meetings, you have to, to visit with groups of people, you are often asked to go and speak. Uh, you do so many things that are outside the activity of the rest of the council. Uh, as to whether or not you have any particular authority, we simply have the same voting power as it stands right now. There are equal one vote apiece for each member of the council. Um, that seems perfectly reasonable, but there is a drawback or two. Can't make motions, can't second motions. It's a, there's a lot of, of uh, activity that you would like to engage in that you have some limitation on unless you can get two other council members to join in ahead of time. Mr. Gajewski. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as, as the mayor said, obviously there's no controversy here, I don't think, with our charter is, uh, is what it is. Uh, the, the mayor chairs the meetings, but the mayor has the, has the power of, uh, of bully pulpit. Uh, so the, the mayor has the power to try and bring the council together behind, uh, behind the mayor on, uh, on issues. Uh, and uh, that's what I would bring to the table. I would unite the council so we wouldn't have these three, two votes with the mayor in the minority on, on, on many votes. Uh, I, I can't imagine myself being mayor and being in a minority on important decisions moving forward. I would make sure I work with my council members uh, so, that we, uh, so that we arrive at a compromise that would be at least satisfying to, to, to four uh, council members. Now, the mayor is also the diplomatic chief of, uh, uh, of our city. Uh, I'm insanely jealous, Mayor Marcuccio, for that handshake with, uh, with President Obama uh, today. Um, I, I myself uh, had an had a hour-long meeting with Ike Leggett today. Uh, I can't claim it was on, uh, on Rockville issues, but it, we have a great relationship. Thank you. Ms. Marcuccio? Uh, I think we need to examine exactly what the responsibilities of the mayor and council are and of the city manager. Uh, if I'm re-elected, I uh, think we will go ahead with that charter commission because we have, uh, we have a couple of little issues that have got to be straightened out. You can't have one council member or the mayor doing one thing and all four others doing something else. We're in a position where it's very hard <clears throat> to pull them all together. Thank you. Next question is for Mr. Gajewski. This is from the floor, and thank you. We're getting a number, a great number of questions from the floor. What do you propose to do about the high cost of infrastructure investment and repair? This summer, a leak on the corner of Beale and Forest cost over a million bucks to fix. Well, in terms of the, uh, the cost of the infrastructure or repair, uh, I propose we pay it. Uh, that's, uh, that's what we have to do. That's what we need to do. Um, uh, I am a, a strong supporter of our investment in infrastructure. In fact, I, I voted for financing the water pipe replacement program and the repair program that, 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 Mr., that Mr. Hadley mentions. That is another difference between me and Mayor Marcuccio. Mayor Marcuccio voted against financing that, uh, that program. She was actually the only one on the council to vote against. Uh, if she had prevailed on that vote, it would not be going forward. I, and I feel it's terribly important. Now on future votes, to her credit, she changed her mind and she did vote for it. But had she prevailed on the original vote, it, it would not have been going forward. There are other infrastructure that we need to worry about. Uh, the police headquarters is, is a big one, which Mayor Marcuccio also voted against financing. The police headquarters is ex extraordinarily important for our city. Uh, for, time is up. I'll talk about it later. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Ms. Okay. Marcuccio. Um, let's just first say 
I have, uh, I have had a variety of voting challenges when it comes to bond issues. As far as our water system is concerned, I have been with it all the way. Do you realize that ultimately this water rehabilitation will cost the city $76 million? $76 million. Some of it will be in your water bill and some of it will be from other sources. But basically the city has to come up with that money. Now, we are often asked to pass bond bills. They sometimes have two and three things in them at once. They're not just the water bill. They're not just, and I want to make a comment about the police depart department. It started out at five million. Do you know it's now going to cost you 10 million? How many police could we put on the street for that extra five million? Thank you. Mr. Gajewski? Well, first of all, we couldn't put any police on the street because they wouldn't have a place to be. That's why we need the, the headquarters. But the mayor said with respect to the water pipe replacement program that she has been with it all the way. So now, I, for you folks at home, on March 28, 2011, the mayor voted against issuing bonds for water pipe replacement project. Had she prevailed, the project would not be going forward. You can see it on video on demand on the Rockville channel. Thank you. Next question is for Ms. Marcuccio. In Rockville, large institutional developments such as Victory Housing and commercial usage such as cell phone towers can be approved in residential neighborhoods. Older neighborhoods are particularly vulnerable. Do you think that the zoning ordinance should be changed, and if so, in what ways? As far as cell towers are concerned, <coughs> uh, we do have a limitation on height in neighborhoods. Uh, and the last cell tower that I think we had uh, to discuss was on the Julius West <coughs> property. And that wasn't even our property, but we protested, and the school system essentially agreed with us. Um, the only other tower uh, that was under question was one in Twin Brook, in which they wanted to build one quite tall behind the one side of the shopping center. And the community said this was an eyesore. They did not want it. So it was inappropriate at the time. I would question the, the value of putting high cell towers all over the city. I don't think that's appropriate. We have one on the golf course. It works just fine. Uh, <clears throat> the other portion of the question was with regard to the cell towers and... Uh, you know, it mentioned late. specifically victory housing, oh, but victory lar housing. Insti large institutional developments was the reference. Well, I've, I've run out of time, so... <laughs> Saved by the bell. <laughs> yeah. Good. Mr. Gajewski. Uh, I, I think on this, again, our, our positions are uh, identical. Uh, both of us were on the council when the council engaged in a... Uh, comprehensive review of the of the zoning ordinance. In fact, we worked together um, on on several issues. Uh, I remember uh, uh, Mayor Marcuccio and I were were adamant about uh, about home business uses and uh, and such uh, being uh, being permitted. Uh, so I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't advocate that we that we look at our zoning uh, ordinance in a comprehensive way again. Uh, at the time we did it, we did some wonderful things. We lowered the the height that uh, in in the residential zones for, uh, for for individual buildings to sort of go in the face of the so-called mansion uh, you know mansion thing. Um, we also invented a new zone, a park zone, which we invented for the first time, and we zoned many properties, including the Redgate Golf Course. So when we were having this discussion recently about how to solve our uh, Redgate Golf Course uh, issue, uh, not having it green was not an issue because it's a park zone. Thank you. Uh Ms. Marcuccio, do you support expanding? Well, she takes 30 seconds, and then the next one's on me. <laughs> <laughs> Help yourself. We have about seven minutes left in your session. I'm sorry to rob you of your 30 seconds. Please proceed. No, go ahead, please. Oh, all right. Um, you know, I think there are more um, other issues in the city that, than uh, just the cell tower issues when it encroaches on neighborhoods. I, I think we need to look very carefully at what sort of things we bring into the community. 
I'm so pleased that our communications task force came up with a new process whereby no one can build anything that is going to be close to a community's neighborhood without having gone through some kind of an alert system with that neighborhood. And that is tremendously valuable, and I think her communi communications task force needs a praise for that. Okay. Uh, next question. Do you support expanding the council to seven members with staggered terms? Mr. Yes. Uh, I mean, that's a sort of a short answer. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, we have uh, grown as a city, uh, and in you know, some decades we haven't, we haven't changed uh, how we're governed. Uh, it has come, uh, we, we have arrived at the point where five council members uh, are, are not enough to represent, and all elected at large, are not enough to represent a city of, uh, of over 60,000. Um, I think we could use additional voices. Uh, in the car, and I think additional voices would bring uh, bring up the possibility of uh, more dialogue, more more negotiation, and then more coming together. In our present system, it is possible, and this is frightening. It is possible for a major decision to be made on the city council by just two votes. If there is a council member missing, two votes constitutes a majority, you know, if there are two council members missing, two votes will constitute a majority and could, uh, and, and could pass a major ordinance or, or other, other piece of legislation. So, yes. Ms. Marcuccio. Uh, yes, indeed. I have suggested this several times, and uh, I would have uh, pulled that together this time in a, a community, in a charter review, if at all possible, but I chose not to do it. Um, I would indeed do it for next time. And I also would like to see four years. I think what we have right now is very difficult for the council and very difficult for the staff to have this endless, um, what I would call campaigning that goes on from the minute you are elected to the next time you're going to be elected, a little like our House of Representatives. And that's not healthy for the city. We need a little continuity. I would not only like to see seven members, I'd like to see staggered terms so that every two years we do continue our two-year cycle of elections. I think that we could set up something so that the mayor runs with one of those two sets. Uh, it's not easy to have a conversation about a project in the city with one person. You need more than that to talk with. Thank you. Mr. Gajewski. I think Charter Commission might be a great idea. The mayor has been proposing it for, for years. Uh, I'm not quite sure why we, why we haven't done it. Um, Four-year terms is, is something we should look at seriously, but I know that our citizens have rejected this concept uh, several, uh, several times, um, and one, once uh, you know, re reasonably recently. So I would be concerned about uh, f going to four-year terms, but it's definitely something we should, uh, we should look at. Uh, and what else did we talk about? Staggered terms only applies if it's four-year terms. Okay, thank you. Did I get my 30 seconds? No, you that do. was my 30 seconds. That was his 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Got to chair this thing. You, you nice try. <laughs> nice try. We have about three, three minutes left. I'm going to ask you, and you don't need to, but I'm going to ask you if we yield the 30-second response time so we just have answer, answer, and so we can get more questions in. Um, are you comfortable? Let's see. We're back to Mr. Gajewski. I'm sorry, I keep losing track. Okay, okay, sorry about it. You, you, you know, I'm just seeing if you guys are on your toes, right? Are you comfortable with the city's current debt level, and if you had to prioritize spending, which items or capital improvements would you minimize or cut? First answer, no, I am not satisfied with its, its debt. We have $148 million plus another 33 that is going to still be with us while we try to clean up what's going on with the garages. That's a lot of debt. Do you know that it, every year we have to pay $5.7 million to service that debt? I'm sorry, in these fiscal times, that's not healthy for the city of Rockville. So I am not at all happy with the debt. Um, as to what in the world would we cut in the future? Well, I'm not so sure that I'm ready to cut anything until we have a little closer look at how we're spending money, what we're spending money on, and I'm still not satisfied that I know. And until I can get a good hard look at that, I'm not going to suggest cutting anything. 
Monsieur Gajewski. Sure, absolutely. The city of Rockville has a triple-A bond rating. The United States does not. The city of Rockville does. The reason we have our AAA bond rating is because we borrow extremely responsibly. And we borrow responsibly at a very, very low interest rate because of our AAA bond rating. So, yes, I'm absolutely happy with how we're going about it. It's what allows us to do projects like the water pipe replacement project, which is so important because pipes are bursting all over the city. There was a major, uh, major repair that needed to be done last year. Uh, and also, some aren't even del delivering enough pressure to our, water uh, to our fire hydrants. We need, we need to be doing this. Now, our debt is supported by tremendous tax base, which is very stable, which is great. Uh, but note that our debt is not all tax supported. Also, the w water fees also uh, also support that debt. In terms of eliminating project I, projects, I couldn't disagree more with Mayor Marcuccio. We absolutely have to identify projects uh, to eliminate. We're down a steep down path if we do not. Okay, I'm going to have two more questions for you as briefly as we can. We're just about out of time. First one is that two citizens' objections to the Silverwood annexation, which is the Reed Brothers site, were that families and children would be living next to the dump. And the second one was that if children went to school in Montgomery County schools, there's no guarantee that that couldn't change through redistricting or by, by parents or children applying to come to Rockville schools. What responses do you have to those? Is it my turn? Yes. My turn? Yes. Did I rob you? Because we didn't have the 30 seconds back, so now you get to okay. the last person finishing. Go ahead. Trying to keep track. Go ahead, Mr. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. That's okay. Um, it's, can, can I start time right now? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, super. Uh, so the Silver Road project is in my neighborhood, in King Farm, uh, and uh, it's not next to, a, uh, next to a dump. It's several properties over from, uh, from, the, tra from the transfer station. Uh, there, are actually, uh, there are actually apartments uh, and townhomes in King Farm that are closer to the transfer station than the Silver pro uh, Silverwood project. So that's some of the misinformation about the project. In terms of where kids go to school, first of all, it's mostly one-bedroom apartments. There aren't going to be very many kids. Uh, they are going to the Gaithersburg cluster. Um, and uh, if there's going to be a realigning, I hope the realigning happens uh, with a King Farm Elementary School. Um, but, there, but there won't be. There's plenty of capacity in Gaithersburg, which is, uh, you know, which is the wonderful th the thing, the, the well-kept secret. Where I live on the north side of King Farm, we go to Rosemont Elementary School. There's plenty of capacity. I think it's like 85% capacity, something like that. But yet kids are fighting to go to College Gardens Elementary because it's a wonderful school, even though it's over capacity. Ms. Marcuccio. Uh, yes, well, uh, I, I don't know quite how to measure as far as the distance from the, the waste management plant is concerned, but if you look at the borders of the property of the waste management territory, it, it shares a border with the back of this new Silverwood property. Now, I'm not sure where we're measuring from when we say one is closer to the other. When you share a common border, it seems to me like you're a neighbor. That uh, waste management plant will be at full capacity. Does 800,000 tons of recycle and garbage right now. In another three, four, five years, it will be at capacity, which is 850,000 tons annually. And at that point, it will be going 24-7. Now, is that what we want to put people next to? Thank you. Time for closing statements. Again, Mr. Gajewski, you'll be first. I, I go, I go, I go we'll just keep the alphabetical order. Alphabetical order. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it was a great pleasure uh, to participate. Uh, I do want to correct that some of the facts about the, the transfer station capacity are, are not accurate. Right now they operate only four days a week at, uh, at 10 hours a day, uh, and they have extreme amount of capacity because they, you know, if by 50 percent, if you increased it by 50 percent, uh, you, you could just add a day and a couple of hours. They will never operate it, need to operate it 24-7. Um, the difference between the mayor and I are two visions, uh, different visions that we have. Uh, my vision for Rockville is based in strong infrastructure investment, uh, including, I've already mentioned, our water pipe replacement program, and so important, uh, our, police, uh, our police headquarters. 
uh, both of those, if the mayor had prevailed, would not be going forward. And with respect to the water pipe replacement program, if she's elected, re-elected, uh, she could actually stop that program, which I think would be terrible for the city of Rockville. Uh, uh, my vision is based on a vibrant town center with appropriate economic development, um, and uh, when, when appropriate, also in partnership with, uh, with Montgomery County. Uh, and here, a great example is Choice Hotels, Choice Hotels headquarters is relocating to town center. I think it's a great thing. The mayor was the only one on the council who voted against the deal to bring Choice Hotel headquarters to town center. Uh, the, 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 the headquarters will have 500 employees who will pour into town square and support our businesses in town square, which are in great need of you know, of people walking, walking in and out. So uh, this, is a, this is a fantastic deal. Uh, it could be the deal that saves Town, town Square. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, again, it's been a great pleasure. Our visions are very different. If you share my vision, I urge you to vote for me on November 8th. Thank you. Ms. Marcuccio. All right. Well, as best I can say is nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. Of course I'll keep the city in good shape. If we have got to, out of some incredible necessity, borrow money, we'll look at it very carefully before we do it. Um, I, I am I'm, uh, I'm flabbergasted at the notion that I would not be the most responsible mayor you could ever have. I care so doggone much about this place and what happens to it. And I would, I'm telling you, I would turn over every leaf to find the facts about an issue before we make any decision. Um, our city is undergoing a tremendous amount of pressure now. You know, you hear smart growth everywhere. I want to grow smart. And we've got to have a plan for the future, something that protects our future, something that shows how we are moving forward in a managed way, not just a willy-nilly Build it wherever you can. Whoever's got the money, let's do it. We don't want that. This is a city which had prides itself on being a wonderful place to live and a wonderful place to raise children. We are going to be challenged on the north and the south by tremendous growth and development. You're going to have a new city council. You're going to have a new city manager. You're going to have a new city clerk. Don't you want somebody there who's a steady well, a thoughtful individual who is going to be able to lead the group into something that will be what we want for the city. You know, I listen to you. This is not about me. This is about you and what you as citizens want for the place that you live and the place you pay taxes. And I'll do everything in my power to, to keep that in my every action. Thank you. And thanks to both of you. Applause is in order. We will take a five-minute break while we assemble the council candidates. Thanks to you both.
and a deadly silence fell over the crowd. Of course not. Okay, we are reconvened. Welcome back. We're in the uh, council candidates section of our debate. And I want to uh, relate to each of you our basic ground rules. Mind your manners. No, I'm kidding. Uh, you, you do that very well. We're going to have one-minute opening statements for each of you. We will proceed in alphabetical order. Uh, and we will have one minute only for answering the questions. Sorry, that's pretty brief, but there's a lot of you. We are going to have until... Ten minutes of nine for this session, so almost an hour. Uh, we'll reserve the time for your one-minute closing statements at the end. We're not going to play the rebuttal game, per se, but we thought that for any one question that any one of you answers, there may be others of you who would like to chime in at some level. So if you will raise your hands. I'm going to work in an alphabetical order all the way through. You've seen my great skill at keeping track of who's speaking. <laughs> My mother would be proud. Um, so in, in that hand raising after one person answers, I will call on you if you would like to add about a 15-second add-in. Okay? Time is tight. We're not going to really time you on that second part, but please remember we're trying to get everyone in. And uh, Mr. Trahan, I figure by the end of the evening we'll probably get to you in some way, shape, or form. So, okay. Keep the faith, brother. All right. Uh, if we're ready to proceed, we'll start with Mr. Francis, who advised me to keep track. You're easy to keep track. Okay. Um, Rockville's model for funding are we use... Doing, are we doing opening statements? I did it again, didn't I? <laughs> you see, I am very consistent. Yes, you are. Okay. You are. Opening <laughs> statements. I will step out of your way. And again, if you remain proximate to your mics, even though you're not standing, okay. we'll have better audio. All right. It said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. Uh, the city has been borrowing, taxing, spending, borrowing, taxing, spending for more than a decade now, and the results that they've gotten is about $150 million of bond indebtedness, $33 million of unfended pension responsibilities, and about $6 million a year in debt service. Just those three items represents twice the annual operating body of the city of Rockville. Uh, one of the trends the economists see is going to be municipal bankruptcy in the next five to ten years. Rockville, given that history, is right at the top of that list. There's a need for new ideas, new tools, and new thinking in the city of Rockville, and I think I'm probably the only one who's talking about some new ideas. One of them is talking about changing how we get our money. I'm proposing eliminating the residential property tax and getting our money from a piggyback income tax. I also want to thank the Fraternal Order of Police for endorsing me for council. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any follow-up folks who would like to make a statement? You don't want to object to his opening statement? I just thought, you know. Okay. Mr. Godfrey. Hello, my name is Richard Godfrey, and I'm running to safeguard our community assets, our schools, our parks, and our public services. I want to tell you a little about myself. Um, I live in Twinbrook for about 10 years, and I've lived in the Montrose community for about 11 years. I'm a CPA. I work for um, one of the largest public accounting firms, uh, the Big Four, KPMG. Um, I have a BS in accounting from Syracuse University and a Master's of Science in Taxation from uh, Georgetown. I'm a small business owner here in the city of Rockville, and I'm a professor of accounting at Montgomery College. I serve as controller and director of finance for National 4-H Council, $25 million um, association. Got recently married to my lovely wife, Stacy Freeman Godfrey. She's, um, you've met her. And also my father-in-law, Charles Freeman. And I really have to give a great shout-out to them. They have walked the neighborhood for me. Over 2,000 households supported me. I really enjoy... Oh, okay. You'll never know what he really enjoys. Okay. <laughs> I really enjoy the recreational service. Okay. okay. Live on tennis. Mr. Hall. I really enjoy it. 
Good evening. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight, and especially to thank the Western Citizens Association, and Mr. Hadley, for uh, for hosting us. My name is John Hall, and I'm a candidate for the Rockville City Council. Several years ago, it was my honor to serve as your council member, and during which time I co-authored the city's first adequate public facilities ordinance. I authored landmark legislation to protect the lives and property of Rockville's residents. I supported limits on the expansion of institutional uses in neighborhoods, and I helped to realize the vision of our town center. For all of us here and now, this campaign focuses on our vision for Rockville's future. What we hope our community will look like and feel like in the coming years, what will be our key budget and city service priorities, whether we're committed to responsibly managing growth, and whether we will have the kind of responsive, civil, and open government that we all deserve. You'll hear more about my positions in the hour ahead, but you deserve to know now that I am committed to preserving the APFO, achieving a sensible budget for all of us that respects our values and sense of fiscal responsibility, and committed to better governance for the city that we all deserve. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Uh, thank you to the West End for sponsoring this forum tonight. Uh, to my neighbor, Susan Prince, for organizing it, to Don for moderating. I'd also like to thank my daughter, Katie, for being here tonight with all of her siblings. She is celebrating her 14th birthday here instead of doing anything fun. <laughs> my name is Tom Moore, and I'm running because Rockville's next mayor and council have some great opportunities to shape the future of this city, and I want to be a part of that. One of the first things they're going to be doing is hiring a new city manager. This position is absolutely key to making this city run smoothly. I want someone who's experienced, someone who loves this city, and someone who can carry out the vision of the mayor and council. But most of all, I want somebody who's not afraid to push back. The city manager is the professional in the room, and if we're doing something that's a mistake, I want to hear about it. Next thing the mayor and council have the opportunity to do is shape the next uh, chapter of town center. I was one of the leaders of the citizen campaign to build the heart of town center, the library, and I'm really excited about this opportunity to help write down town's next chapter. Thank you for coming out, and I look forward to your questions. Ms. Newton. Thank you. My name is Bridget Newton. I've been a Rockville resident since 1981. Uh, we've lived in our home in the West End since 1985. Um, thank you to the West End for hosting tonight's forum. And Don, you're doing a great job keeping track. <laughs> <laughs> I'd hate to see a bad job. <laughs> Um, I, I want to tell you, the mayor and I had an incredible experience today. We were invited to the White House, one of, uh, we were two of 140 individuals who had a four-hour briefing with various cabinet secretaries. Uh, we then met with the president, and both Phyllis and I got to shake his hand, and I'm still shaking. It was very exciting. And that is one of the benefits of our involvement in the Maryland Municipal League and the League of Cities, National League of Cities, is the connections that we make and the ability that we have um, garnered to work with other city leaders throughout the country. Uh, it was an absolutely wonderful day. There were, as I said, 140 of us from throughout the country. And I want to continue that as we go forward in Rockville. When I ran two years ago, I ran because I thought we could make a difference, and I still think we can. We've done some wonderful things. I'd like another chance to keep going. Thank you. My turn. Thank you. I'm sorry. Ms. Onley. Okay. My name is Virginia Onley. I work for IBM for 35 years. This means I understand budgets and what it means to conduct myself with, in a professional, respectful manner. At IBM, if you weren't civil, you were out. Same thing my mother taught me. I am currently on the Americana Center Homeowners Board, where I served as president. This means I understand the great responsibility and challenges involved with spending other people's money and keeping citizens involved. I'm a retired fixed income grandmother, and I have a reputation for not giving up. I didn't give up when I had breast cancer, and I didn't give up when I had busted hips. I've had to learn to walk three times in my lifetime. I have my sleeves rolled up, and I'm ready to go. Trouble relationships with the county and the college, talk to me, I'm listening. Let me go to work for you. Vote for me on November 8th. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Perchella. My name is Mark Prashela, and I'm just completing my first term as council member, your council member. I came to this job with 10 years of preparation at College Garden Civic Association, several as block captain, started out knocking on doors, two as secretary, and four as president of the association. And I was responsible for helping to bring an award-winning park and stormwater management pond to College Gardens. I'm a statistician, I'm a business owner, 
I've just been named to the National Academy of Sciences expert panel on a redesign of an important federal survey. My three issues, big issues, are budget sustainability, preparing Rockville for an uncertain future, and I continue to protect Rockville's neighborhoods. All those three things add up to protecting the residents of Rockville. As we go forward in these uncertain times, I want to keep the programs and services that you expect at a reasonable tax rate, and in order to do that, we need to plan for the future. Thank you. Mr. Trahan. <clears throat> My name is Dion Trahan. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting the president when he was a junior senator from Illinois on the Hill. And people told him he was too young, he hasn't served his government long enough, and frankly, he didn't know enough to be president. I really draw on that inspiration during this, this experience. Um, I have a poli sci degree uh, from the Citadel uh, Military College of South Carolina, where I also received my commission um, as an armor officer in the Louisiana National Guard. I have a JD and a bachelor's in civil law uh, from uh, LSU Law. I have an LLM from American University, and uh, it's a concentration in laws and government with a focus on constitutional law and civil rights. I'm a planning commissioner. Um, I'm a member on the Citizen Implementation Committee. I'm a HOA secretary of uh, my neighborhood, Lincoln Park. I'm an active member in uh, Lincoln Park Civic um, Association. Uh, I worked in the um, Democratic Caucus in the Majority Whip's office and on the Veteran Affairs Committee. I was a council and professional staff member for oversight and investigations. Thanks to all of you. First question to Mr. Francis. Are you ready? I guess so. Rockville's model for funding uses uses a combination of long-term debt and cash on hand. Gaithersburg does not carry long-term debt, but rather funds itself solely through property taxes, which they just increased by 5%. Which model or other model do you favor and why? Again, I fa favor the model that will take the burden off of the homeowner and put it uh, squarely in the back of everybody who has the ability to pay their taxes with a piggyback income tax. At the present time, 70% of the residents of the city are paying 100% of the taxes to run the government. That's wrong. By expanding to a piggyback income tax, the tax base will be expanded, there'll be more money coming into the city to run government operations, and there'll be more money to pay off the, the bloated debt and bring <clears throat> the pension fund into, into proportion where it should be. So I'm, I'm I'm proposing a complete change in the funding mechanism for the city. And do we have follow-up comments by any other members? Okay, in order, we'll start with Mr. Moore. I think it's prudent for households to carry debt in the form of mortgages, and I think it's prudent for cities to carry debt like we carry with our bond debt. It allows us to do more, more cheaply, and it, it saves the taxpayers money. Ms. Newton. Um, I actually am not a proponent of more debt. We have over $140 million of debt. I'd like to see us go more to a pay-as-you-go um, method where if we have a priority pr uh, project, we, we find funding for that project. Um, I think the burden that is now on our taxpayers, I believe it's $9,000 per household if we were to call in all the debt that we currently have, is unsustainable. So I'd like okay. to see us make changes. Mr. Pershala. I just want to remind everything. We've just been reaffirmed on our AAA bond rating. We went out for some refinancing of our park and garage debt. The rating agencies tell us we have a modest level of debt. It makes sense to a certain extent to indebt ourselves for certain projects. We have actually already eliminated many, many items from our capital improvements program that were new things. The only thing left in the capital improvement programs are now maintenance of things, things like um, you know, maintaining the swim set or that kind of thing. We were ta we've already taken all, all new things from that. Mr. Trahan. Um, oh, six, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Are you okay? All right, Mr. Trahan. Uh, Sixty percent of residents of Rockville have been here ten years or less. They make up what's called creative class, uh, young professionals, juxtaposed with seniors being the largest growing segment of the city, which means we have to really think smartly. Um, the bond issue, it's a real delicate balance between how much we tax fees and permits um, to make companies come here versus how much we actually put on the residents. Because if we're not careful, we're actually going to tax ourselves out of the market, where young professionals will lose that allure of coming to Rockville and actually owning something. Um, the reason my wife and I moved to Rockville, we couldn't afford anything in Bethesda. 
Gaithersburg was too far for our commute, but Rockville was perfectly situated. It gave us the best, the best of both worlds. But if we keep leaning too much on these bonds, and when we take a five-year snapshot, yeah, it looks good. And we probably could pay off our water infrastructure in, twin, in three years if we gave everything to that. But that's not accounting for debt services. So when you look at it, thank you. Thank you for cooperating. Ms. Onley? Well, I'd like to take the burden off the tax holders. I mean, I think everybody knows that Rockville is the goose that lays the golden egg for the state of Maryland. And when I'm elected, one of the first things I'd like to do is to meet with the District 17 team to see if we can get some of the taxpaying money that we put into the state of Maryland for our infrastructure. I think that would help the city of Rockville tremendously. Thanks to you all. The next question, we start with Mr. Gottfried. Given the city's aging water and sewer infrastructure, which will require, this says 10 million in long-term debt, I think Mr. Um, Gajewski suggested it's a $70 million project. But, so one question is, what does it cost, if you know, to get our water and sewer system in, intact? Uh, but if that debt is spread over only 13,000 Rockville household accounts for those utilities, it, would it be better if we get out of the utility business and return our infrastructure to the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission? I don't know the total cost unless you can hand me a budget book. I'll uh, look it up for you. But the plan that's been in place, you know, we, we have two hits with the, with the water infrastructure. One is um, the cost from the Blue Plains uh, Waste Management System, and the second is um, making sure that our old pipes um, are, are now new pipes because they have a ton of, uh, a lot of erosion. So the plan has been put in place that our water rates have gone up by 25% every year. What's not been talked about is that in, in the five-year forecast, we're going to end up with about $4 million of cash in the bank. So I think, not I think, but we need to revisit the increase in the 25% in our water rates, the increase of 13% in our sewer rates, which is going to end up in another $5 million. That's $9 million. And um, to understand why we need that much cash five years from now. And do we really need to have these increase in rates? And hands raised for those who would like to comment, starting uh, with Mr. Hall. Thanks. Uh, with regard to returning um, or, or yielding to uh, WSSC, I, I would not support that. Um, I think that uh, the service that uh, is provided by the city is a, uh, a gold-plated service, and it's one that um, allows for much more responsiveness uh, to the community. I do think that we have to make all the necessary investments in that infrastructure. That's key. Um, and to the extent that, um, that we need to do that, I think we should. Okay. Mr. Moore, did you want to do it? Yeah. For the next four years, we're spending $55 million uh, on water and sewer infrastructure repairs. We're also saving or putting away $55 million for that. Those, those are exactly in balance. I'm not sure where, where Mr. Godfrey is getting his numbers. We're not, having large, we're not having large surpluses in this. In, the, in next year alone, we're putting off $4.5 million in capital improvements that we should be making. Ms. Newton. Uh, there's something that hasn't been said about our AAA bond rating, which is wonderful that we have it, but the, one of the reasons you get a AAA bond rating is because you can tax your citizens. And I think that that is often left out of the conversation. We don't just tax in Rockville, we have fees, and our fees are rising faster than our citizens say they can, they can afford them, and I know for a fact that's true for the Newtons. Um, when I look at our water bill, I'm astounded, and there's only two of us there most of the time. Um, I really think we've got to get a better way. It, when you have needs that have to happen, it, we need to treat our, our people's budget like we treat our own budget. And if you need a new roof and you've got a kid in college, you're not going to Disney World. So we need to really scale back and start putting our priorities and, and making sure we're doing things as we need them. Ms. Onley, I will not overlook you this time. Okay. Uh, well, I would not uh, want to move to WSSC. I think that the services provided here in the city are very good. Um, as far as the increase in the water bills, we had the same thing at the Americana Center. I'm on the homeowners board there, and we operate like a mini city. We govern the same way the city does, and unfortunately, when we should have been more proactive, we weren't. So now we're in, re in reactive. And I spoke to the director of finance for the city, and we've got plans in place 
it's going to raise the fees, but it's going to get us where we need to be. And we did the same thing at Americana. We had to raise the condo fees, so it got us where we need to be in the proactive state instead of reacting to the busted water pipes. Mr. Purcell. Yeah, I, I just want to remind people that, um, that you haven't seen the last of the water uh, situation. Where I, I, we have asked city staff to come to the next mayor and council and talk about water funding. There's a lot of stuff coming down the pipe, so to speak. Uh, we're we're going to be looking at new water towers because we have new EPA guidelines on the quality of water, and those, and those water towers are like 10 or 14 million dollars each. We just had a water main bus that cost four or five million dollars. After this current regime of replacing water pipes, we're going to see another regime of placing water pipes. If we were to give all this to WSSC, that wouldn't stop the bills because they wouldn't take it unless we were willing to pay for it because we, they wouldn't just take our problem and fund it for us. So, so that, that's not really an option. Thank you. Mr. Trehan. Uh, I'm a fan of telling everyone that not only am I running for city council, but I'm also running for the water and sewer board where the uh, mayor and council wear two hats. Um, my question is why wasn't the project started in the fiscal year 2009, the city started a major water line replacement program with 34 miles of pipe being replaced for the next 20 years. Um, why do we have to wait until the, econo the economy went bust? Um, I often think, why didn't we do this back in 2001, 2002, 2005, whenever the economy was booming? So that's irrelevant because now it's our problem. So again, being the youngest candidate here, I am going to be here in 20 years. Um, I do want not this to be burdensome. Um, so we're still going to have to be paying for this, uh, regardless of us here are here or not. Um, but all jokes aside, Again, um, this is just indicative of us not really being visionary. And do we want to continue to be reactive? Because everyone will tell you what the right answer is, but the facts is in the budget. Um, we didn't get this started until 2009, so now it's our problem. Um, and it's going to be my problem for the next 20 years. Thank you. We appreciate your taking on the burden for all of this. There we go. There we go. The rest of us can leave now, right? No. Mr. Hall, this is your kickoff opportunity. Uh, the need for affordable housing is real and growing. In the West End, there is a concentration of affordable housing. The master plan calls for affordable housing to be dispersed and scattered with sensitivity to the communities. Do you support changing the master plan to remove this requirement? And if not, how would you ensure a more balanced distribution of affordable housing throughout the city? Okay. Um, well, I certainly do uh, support the requirement that affordable housing be uh, properly shared uh, among communities, uh, and I think that that's not been the case, um, neither in the West End nor in, uh, uh, in other, uh, certain other parts of the city. Um, I certainly support affordable housing. In fact, we, I support our... Um, uh, our MPDU uh, requirements uh, that we imposed uh, on the most recent developments in Town Center and at Twinbrook Commons uh, and elsewhere. Um, but I do think that it has to be properly uh, spread across the city um, for a lot of reasons, both for access and also for um, uh, convenience. And so that's something that I would uh, continue to support. Okay. Do we have other comments? Okay, we'll, we'll circle back this way. Okay, Ms. Onley, I believe you're first. I'm on Rockville's Enterprise Housing Board. I chair that. And I believe that we do need affordable housing, but I think it needs to be mixed in. If anyone has been, people who have been here a while know of Lincoln Park. And right now there's a development legacy. Before legacy was in existence, that was a drug-infected, infested project. And the residents of Lincoln Park got together, decided that they wanted to clean up that section of the neighborhood. And they did that. And I think we need more houses like that. It, we need affordable housing, but it needs to be mixed use. It needs to be mixed into all communities. Other comments? All right, coming back alphabetically, Mr. Gottfried. Sure. Um, I'm surprised John Hall didn't pick it up since he was the author, but I, uh, <laughs> I'll just, I guess I'll help him out here. But we shouldn't have affordable housing at the expense of the APFO. I think one of, one of the things that happened in the West End was there was this, you know, a, a proposal for a development um, that ignored the APF, tried to ignore the APFO for the um, 
um, overcrowding of schools and, and school capacity and traffic capacity. And uh, when we had in Twinbrook, in our Twinbrook neighborhood plan, 2007, in the mixed-use retail, they also tried to um, circumvent the APFO um, when they're trying to build a mixed-use uh, development. Okay. And Ms. Newton, I believe you were next. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, I absolutely uh, support our master plan and the scattered um, site because it's the only way to have a community that works well is to have all types of housing shared together and not have clusters of one type. Um, I was on the, actually I was the co-chair of the subcommittee that worked on the Bell's Grant issue and I think Rockville um, has an APFO, but it is not an APFO to get rid of affordable housing. It's an APFO to protect the city from all types of overdevelopment. And we need to be very careful not to mix up the two. Um, there are ways to bring in, as, as um, Virginia Onley is saying, good developments, legacy is a prime example of when it really works. So we need to have more of that. Thank you. Mr. Prashala. Just quickly, um, master plan also calls for putting affordable housing near mass transit centers. And so there is internally in a master plan some contradiction. So I just wanted to point that out. Okay. Thank you. The next question is to Mr. Moore. Start your motor. Yes. Um, and we'll stay on the APFO theme. This is a write-in, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm reading Sanskrit in part. No offense to whoever did this. But basically the question is this. This, this write-in person says that he or she understands that the APFO presently would block any new housing development since all of the schools in the local cluster are at or over capacity. And yet at a recent economic summit, the speaker, Mr. Stephen Fuller, reminded the city that there is a great need for more housing if Rockville is to stay economically competitive. How does the council go about reconciling those positions? Well, first of all, you know, I want to preserve our neighborhoods. I want our schools to be much less crowded than they are. For the past six years, the APFO has been the main tool to address this. It has successfully stopped all new residential development in Rockville. The question is whether this is a good idea. The unintended consequences have been that workforce housing and other smart and green housing and, and housing near our transit has ground to a halt. Is this what we want? Uh, I think everybody up here just about uh, agrees that we do want affordable housing in this city. But we're short 8,000 8, uh, affordable housing units in this city. And with the APFO in place, there's no real opportunity to, to address that need. Uh, I keep hearing that the APFO is the only tool we have to deal with development. I disagree. We have a dedicated and knowledgeable planning commission and board of appeals. We have a city planning staff that knows what it's doing. And God help us, we even have a mayor and council to weigh in on these issues. We have lots of tools and lots of common sense at our disposal to address Rockville's development issues. Recommendations and now the APFO should be applied are about to come out. I look forward to seeing what they're going to be. I want us to all to roll up our sleeves and get to work on how we can make sure the APFO works for all of us. Let's make sure it preserves our neighborhoods while not being too rigid for common sense. Thank you. Do we have follow-up comments? Moving down, Ms. Newton. I think John had his hand up first. That's fine. No, well, I'm going alphabetically. Oh, okay. um, I'm well, keeping good order this time okay. around. <laughs> Far be it from me. Um, I absolutely support the APFO, and I think it's one of the reasons that the MCPS is finally talking about school number, elementary school number five for the city of Rockville and a renovation to Twinbrook and additions at Julius West and Bell and Ritchie Park. Um, it's, it's the only way we can get people to stop and listen. Um, it shouldn't be, but it is, and we've got to make sure that we as a city have a vision of how we want to grow. The thought of 8,000 new units coming to the city right now is overwhelming to me, whether they're affordable or luxury or anything. I mean, we just don't have that much empty space left. The school district didn't do a good job of planning their, of forecasting their student populations because they didn't count on the turnover of existing housing stock in Rockville. And as we have an aging population and those houses turn over, and Tom mentioned about his situation, we had the same situation we bought from an elderly, elderly person as well. I mean, that's how this city can grow and turn, and we don't necessarily have to build new developments in order to grow as a city. Ms. Onley, yes. I support the APFO, but it's very important that we continue to use our standards and our codes to control the worst aspects of development and redevelopment. And as a Rockville City Council member, I will continue to push the adequate public facility ordinance for anything that comes before the mayor and council. Okay, Mr. Prashad. Yes, I, I want to say I, I don't think the APFO has worked. 
We are getting a number five elementary school and some other additions. That's more as a result of advocacy by the PTAs, uh, by mayor and council, and others. The county also has an APFO. And the fact that we have tighter standards has led to unnecessary friction. We had to fight off a loss of, of development <clears throat> review sovereignty. We almost lost that for MCPS because of uh, tighter standards that we have in the city made it more difficult for the city to build capacity. Um, I also want to say that the APFO affects not only schools, but it also affects other developments due to, for example, uh, traffic uh, restrictions on intersections that are very tight. So you can imagine the area north of Bell Avenue, just north of town center. You know, there, there's uh, intersections near it that are, you know, past capacity according to our APFO standards could stop that redevelopment north of Bell Avenue. So you have to be careful with the APFO. We need one, but, but we have to have reasonable standards. Thank you. Mr. Trehan. <clears throat> um, I'm in favor of the APFO, but I also don't think any piece of legislation is above being reviewed periodically um, because it was designed and implemented at a time when things were booming in Rockville. It was a complete different atmosphere. Um, buildings are going up left and right from what I understand. Um, but I also believe that no piece of legislation is above being enforced and strengthened. Um, because when you stop and think about it, if there's more schools, the APFO isn't a bar. Um, so it is one of the, the many tools in our toolbox along with advocacy and, and working with our, our state delegation and the county. Um, and people, the other argument is, well, it's going to stifle the economy. Okay, um, Walmart's coming. I don't think that's the kind of economy we want. Um, because heaven forbid if Walmart does come, and it is coming, um, unless we do something about it, the pike is going to change fundamentally. All these small mom-and-pop businesses, um, they might go out of business. And the, the bad part is right, it's right outside of our jurisdiction. So I think we really have to become creative and, and become real citizen advocates. Mr. Francis. Uh, <clears throat> the APFO was passed fairly recently. It made sense then and it makes sense now. Uh, during my two-year term, I would not entertain any modification or waivers at, at all to the APFO. Further comments on this issue? Mr. Hall. I think that I can speak with some authority on the APFO, um, having uh, co-authored it with uh, former Mayor Giamo uh, at a time, incidentally, uh, when we were also approving some uh, significant new development in the city. So I think the um, assertion that the APFO uh, is intended to put the city in moratorium uh, is incorrect. Um, the, uh, the APFO gives us a critical tool um, that we didn't have before. In fact, we were 20 years late to the game. Uh, the county had one 20 years before we did, and it was well overdue for us. What it does is it says you can't have development that outpaces the infrastructure and overburdens the communities. That only makes sense. And the way that you, um, you meet the needs of the APFO, and as well as the needs for new housing, and I have to tell you, 8,000 new units would increase the population of the city by 20%, and that's an awful lot. Um, uh, the way that you achieve those uh, objectives is by working in partnership not only with the county and the, and the uh, school system, but also with developers to get schools like Hungerford open. I think the reason that they even entertain that is because we had an APFO, because it made sense for developers to work with the, the city to do that. And I have to say I give props to the mayor and to Councilmember Newton for their defense of the APFO during the last couple of years. Okay, our next question is to Ms. Newton. This questioner references the, the reduction of trash collection service from twice weekly to once weekly in the fairly recent past. Do you think other services or departments are overstaffed or overprovided? And if so, are there those that could be modified to achieve savings for the city? Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, I think there are probably a lot of things we can do um, savings-wise, and I've been very interested in some of the comments Mr. Francis has made about uh, the size of our, of our staff. Um, I have mentioned a couple times that I think we as a green city should not be paying $450 a month to our senior staff for a car allowance. 
Um, I'm fully supportive of our police chief and our director of public works having a car. They need to be available 24-7. But we should be paying everybody else 51 cents per mile on city business. That would save the city some money. We also give our senior staff 10% annually, whether or not we give a cost of living increase to everybody else. That 10% adds up significantly when you're talking about senior staff who are making it the upper income brackets in the city. Um, there are a lot of things that I think we could do. The budget commission, uh, well, budget task force that I recommended as a budget commission, I think if we could make it a permanent um, group, it could really help us drill down into things and, and find some other ways that we can make better use of our money. So thank you. Follow-up discussion? Okay. Mr. Pershala. I want to write, I want to go through a list of savings we've done the last two years. Mayor and Council took a 3.25% scheduled increase in salaries in fiscal year 2011, froze it for 2011, spread the rest of it out over three years through fiscal year 2014. That saved us $1.1 million in fiscal year 2011 alone and going forward. We changed our insurance and disability carriers in fiscal year 2011. That saved us $600,000 that year. We voted to move Redgate Golf Course from taxpayer subsidy to a leasing arrangement with Billy Castor Golf. Uh, there's a lot of measures, but at least 500000 per year saved, some say more, starting next fiscal year and going forward. We approved a parking garage deal with Federal Realty, saved $300,000 annually, and going forward, uh, we dropped 23 full-time equivalents in the last two years. We've dropped more than that over the last four years. We cut training and professional development activities, except for certifications. We have implemented other efficiencies, such as revising fleet management practices, all of that actually adds up to several million dollars over the years in savings. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Trehan. <clears throat> First of all, I don't believe that we should uh, balance the budget or find cost savings on the back of city employees. Um, and I'm talking about the city employees that are on our sidewalks um, that are doing the services that we enjoy. Um, just looking at the budget a little bit, um, you know, we spent $918,000, $670 in oil and gas. Switching to something as simple as natural compressed gas, that's cost savings. And it's realistic cost savings to, to put in our fleet services. Um, ready. Uh, I have to be careful here because I'm a huge fan of Ready. But what I understand is it was started up with seed money to about $200,000 and it's supposed to be self-sufficient. Now it's $541,300. Um, the HR <coughs> department. Um, Mr. Francis says time and time over again, for a city, city co comparable to our size, it's way too big. And then they spend some like 200 some thousand dollars on training, and these are supposed to be the HR people. So we don't have to come up with really novel ideas. I think we just have to really understand our priorities and look at the budget and really scrub it. Thank you. Mr. Francis? Uh, I want to thank Bridget and Dion for the plug there. Uh, yes, I, I did a great deal of analysis on comparable city operations. Uh, the city of Frederick was the best comparable. Uh, when you look at the city of Frederick, they have a 10% larger population, 50% more land mass. Uh, their uh, human resources department is twice the size of the city of Rockville. They have 10 people. They should have five people like the Fred, 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 city of Frederick has. The finance department uh, and Frederick operates with 9.25 people. Rockville has 30 people in their finance department, and they still miss $900,000 of tax revenue. The IT department in Frederick operates with four people. We need 17 and a half people in the city of Rockville to operate an IT department. And you want to look at parks and recreation? We've got 217 employees. Frederick does a great job with 77. There is a great deal of excess on the payroll in the city. It has to be fixed. It has to be cleaned up. Thank you. Further. Yes, sir. Mr. Gottfried. The city of Frederick is about a $3 million budget. We're a $106 million budget, so we're going to have differences. Three points that Councilman Prichella talked about, about savings, actually cost us the, over the last month about um, $2 million. Yeah, we leased the golf course. But now we have to find, the, this council is going to have to find $300,000 of indirect personnel costs. Number two, the parking garages, we leased them out. We're still going to have to find, we're still funding the bonds, $2.1 million on principal and interest. We still subsidize that. We have to find a million dollars for that. Third one, choice hotels, $1.7 million of our tax revenues. We're going to have to find that money for next year. Further comments, Mr. Hall. 
Yes, sir. Thank you. A um, <clears throat> couple things uh, I want to talk about. On the one hand, uh, budget reductions, and I think you've heard some, some good ideas uh, from others here that I don't necessarily need to repeat. I do want to make the observation that we've got over $1.1 million in non-police overtime, and that's something that we could probably take a, a hard look at. I probably wouldn't have uh, voted to spend $75,000 on a slogan. Um, at the same time, um, I, uh, I think that we have an obligation to, to do something that's wholly consistent uh, with the APFO, and that is to build up our commercial tax base, um, to fill the vacancies, uh, to reduce turnover, maybe to work with the state in partnership and try and get a, a share of the state sales tax. These are the, so it's not just a matter of cutting, but also a matter of, of building up uh, the base without increasing anybody's tax, tax rate, but simply um, making the field larger. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Moore. I think I'll actually keep my answer to 15 seconds. Uh, the uh, Choice Hotels, uh, that is a net profit for this city. Uh, we are not losing $1.7 million in tax revenue. Is We are going to have a net pr um, gain in the amount of taxes that we collect for that property. Right now it's a parking lot, or it was a parking lot before it became a hole that that building is going to go in. We, we gave them some incentive to come here, um, but we are going to get more money in taxes overall from them. That is a net plus for this city. Okay, next question. Ms. Onley, yes, you start your motor. Running. Okay. There we go. All right. Simple question, deep answer. What ideas do you have for expanding our commercial tax base? Funny you just mentioned that, Mr. Holmes. Okay. And how would you accomplish this? Well, one of the things that um, I had mentioned uh, earlier was to um, get some of the that golden uh, uh, egg that we lay for the state of Maryland. I think that's one of the things. Uh, we need to bring in uh, businesses, and uh, we need to work with our District 17 team to um, bring in revenue. Uh, I'd have to look further. I, you know, not served as an elected official, but just as a layperson, that's one of the things that I would do. I, you know, fight hard to, to come up with businesses that would sustain our, our tax base. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I have to take a minute to identify whose arm is which. Okay, Mr. Pershala. Right. Um, certainly, we can make it easier for businesses to do business in Rockville without sacrificing. Um, neighborhood or resident interests. We make them go through long processes. One of the great things about the communication task force is we front-loaded the approval process so neighborhoods know right at the beginning what's coming, but we don't have to drag out that approval process, drag it out, drag it out, drag it out. The uh, inspections can be improved. Uh, we can uh, look again at our zoning ordinance and how tight we are unnecessarily sometimes and what people can and cannot do with their property. There's, there's a whole lot of things. All these can be done without sacrificing neighborhood or resident interests. Thank you. Mr. Trahan, did I see your hand? No, no you. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Ms. Newton. Um, one of the conversations that we had today was with the director of IT for the White House, and he was talking about how going forward we need as cities and municipalities to be more um, to be investing more in, in our intelligence, in our people who live in our communities who have the wherewithal, the data-driven wherewithal, and they can do things that would bring businesses, uh, the new businesses, um, IT-type businesses, to our municipalities. And that would be a great way for Rockville to grow. The, uh, another idea, um, and I've mentioned this before, is phase two of Rockville, which is Bell Avenue North, where the old giant has sat vacant for 10 years. Um, why the city ever allowed that deal, I don't understand. But we've got to get together with the owners, JBG, of that property and help work out a plan that brings that brings more life and energy and business and whatnot there. That would be a great place for a green space, for a village green, for an amphitheater, for office space, for residential. We've got to make some energy going forward. Sorry. All right, and I believe, Mr. Gottfried, you want to get your two cents worth sure, in? Sure, I'll get my two Commercial tax base is great, but again, not at the expense. If we look at the Rockville Pipe Plan, it's again another public-private partnership. And again, it's using our tax dollars, you know, to subsidize that development. And number two, on the choice hotels, let's be clear. The 1.7, again, is our public money. There was no public hearing 
no public process, no work session to discuss the use of our $1.7 million of our tax dollars. And on top of it, it's not a hotel, it's their corporate headquarters, and we can't even use it. Uh, next question is to Mr. Pershala, and you're the lucky recipient of a West End question. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> but it, it, it comes around to the city budget, so it's a broader thing than that. A little long. Uh, I-270 noise levels are of concern and disruption to residents in the West End. The state has indicated that this area is eligible for construction of a sound wall, but the city must agree to fund 20% of the design and construction. Estimated cost, 111000 in fiscal year 2013, 773000 in fiscal year 2014. City staff has recommended. Would you support funding the project if elected? Yeah, it's a no-brainer. Um, we, we need to do it. We can find the money. I don't think we have to bond in order to do it. Anyone else willing to jump on that? Ms. Newton. I will, because when I was president of the West End, Don Kettlestrings, has been work, uh, who's a West End <coughs> resident, has been working on this for quite a long time. Um, when I-270 was originally built, it wasn't built at the 12 lanes that it is now. And what we've done is take away the natural buffer so that homes are very much impacted. People can't even sit in their backyard anymore. So absolutely, I would fund it. Anyone else? Ms. Arnley. I definitely would fund it. I used to live in Frederick County and come down to, it was 70S at the time, and there were two lanes going each way. So there was a lot of property that buffered the sound. And, and if I lived in that area, I would want my elected official to um, agree to fund a sound wall. Okay. Any other takers? Mr. Hall? Yeah, just... Uh, I think all of us uh, are, are in agreement on this. I did meet with uh, Mr. Kettlestrings uh, and experienced uh, what he's experiencing um, personally, although I don't do it uh, on a daily basis. Um, I did want to mention that uh, it seems to me that the heavy lifting in this case was done by the citizens, um, and that's uh, somewhat unfortunate. Uh, I think the city probably could have taken a more aggressive role, and, um, and so I'd like to see that kind of responsiveness from the city in the future. Mr. Guthrie, did you have a response also? Yes, I mean, I, I agree with funding uh, the wall. Again, there was no vision that um, 270 be increased and the, and the noise from the neighborhood, so we need to build the sound wall. Yeah. Okay. This will be the last question in this round. We're then going to go to a different format after this. But for Mr. Trahan, thank you for your patience. You're welcome. You're standing by the American flag, so that means – and the Maryland flag. Okay. <laughs> Do you support the creation – of a Rockville sales tax to allow us to capture revenue generated by our status as a regional shopping destination. Well, my, the first thing in my mind is what would be the alternative? Because initially I want to say, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it makes sense, especially if we want the pike to be viable. Um, in order to make it work, we have to attract people. Um, but then when you look at the White Flint coming up to our south and Gaithersburg to our north, I don't necessarily believe um, a, a tax frenzy might necessarily be <clears throat> the real way to sort of make that viable. Um, that's a long way of saying I don't know all the facts just yet. Um, if you want budget, you know, you got Mark, you got uh, Rich, and you got Les. Um, first things I'd have to educate myself. Um, but just a gut reaction – um, it sounds very alluring and attractive, but I just don't know enough um, for the impacts to really comment intelligently on it. Right. Other comments? Mr. Francis? Uh, I would oppose a Rockville sales tax. Uh, it would be terribly regressive. It would fall disproportionately on Rockville residents. The people who are least, abil least able to pay because of their income levels at a disproportionate level would be bearing the bulk of the burden on it. Uh, I would never vote for any kind of a regressive sales tax or any other regressive tax that would be proposed uh, for city residents. Further, Mr. Hall. Uh, absolutely not. Um, uh, what I want to do and what I said earlier is that I want us to get a share of the state sales tax that already exists. We provide the infrastructure and the services for all of these businesses here, and yet we don't see any share of that revenue. I would not support the city imposing its own sales tax. I think uh, we have an excellent argument for saying that we deserve a small share of uh, the state sales tax that's already existing. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Newton. 
will echo exactly what John said. And, and I think that's one of the things that MML and the League of Cities is for, is for us working together with, our, uh, with other elected officials, especially in Maryland, to get a share of the pie. So I agree with John. Okay. Ms. Arnold? I would not support that. I called us the goose that lays the golden egg for the state of Maryland. And I would, again, meet with the District 17 team to see if we could get some of that Maryland state tax for our infrastructure right here in Rockville. Further comments? Mr. Pershala. Yeah, if we can get a share of the sales tax, that's fine. But I want to caution people, don't hold your breath. There you go. I, I'm also agree. Uh, no, no sales tax and for the same thing that Bridget and uh, John said. Well, we're going to proceed to a different procedure, which euphemistically is called the lightning round. And I guess that depends <laughs> whether it strikes twice or not. But the idea is we're not really working with time limits. Please add, I'll try to ask the question so that you can answer yes or no. And you'll have closing comments later, so if you want to modify your yes or no, you can. If you don't have a yes or no answer, no answer, All right? Uh, so we'll start alphabetically again with Mr. Francis. Pardon? You want to start with Mr. Trahan? Hey. Question about China. Uh, I'd, I'd be more than welcome to. Uh, we were thinking of Burma this time. That, that's right? good okay. too. Okay. We need a sister city okay. there too, so I'm ready. Okay. Um, would you support a widening of Wooten Parkway to alleviate local or to alleviate regional traffic from two lanes to four lanes? No. Next question, Mr. Pershala. Would you support a Teen curfew? No. Teen, T E E N? No. I hear you. Um, Ms. Onley, if the city relationship, new relationship that is a lease with the Billy Casper Golf Organization for Redgate uh, Golf Course were to terminate, would you support a transfer within the city budget? of the Redgate account from the Enterprise Fund to the general parks and recreation budget like Swim Center? No. I'm sorry? Everybody's supposed to answer the question. I'm too much lightning. Everyone's supposed to have a whack at the same question. All right, back up, back up. I, I was struck by lightning. So... <laughs> Okay. I don't get to give any answers. That's what's frustrating me. So uh, let's take that question and proceed. Mr. Pershala, would you mind proceeding with that? And we'll come back alphabetically. This is the Red Gate question? Yes. No. 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 Back to the general fund? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mr. Gottfried says yes. yes. Mr. Hall? Yes. yes. Mr. Moore? Absolutely not. Okay. Ms. Newton? Yes. Was that a vote? <laughs> All right. Now, the previous question the previous question was the teen curfew. Uh, I think we come back up to Mr. Francis. I would not support a teen curfew, no. No. Mr. Godfrey's no. Mr. Hall? No, I support a curfew for the deer. <laughs> <laughs> They're all in my backyard. <laughs> Mr. Moore? No. Ms. Newton? No. Okay. No. Ms. Donnelly? Mr. Pershala? I already said, said no. no. Uh, it's so we have, responsibility. We have no, 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 and no, no's. Okay. Um, Wooten Parkway. Um, let's just go down the line here. Uh, the question again was? Uh, widening from two lanes to four lanes in order to alleviate regional traffic. It would depend on who's going to pay for it. A yes or no? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> no. Uh, no, I was on the uh, council that pulled it out of the uh, plan. Okay, Mr. Moore? No. Okay, Ms. No. Newton, Ms. Onley? No. Mr. Pershaw? No. Mr. Trehan? No again. Okay. You're very disagreeable people, I must say. Okay. Um, this is a tough one. In one word or one descriptor, it might be two words, all right, what is something you disagree with that the current council did that is voted on? Um... I guess we start with you, Mr. Godfrey. Me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Why me? <laughs> that's fine. Uh, the logo. The Rafa logo. The vote on uh, Silverwood. 
Okay, Mr. Moore. Uh, leaving the uh, Board of Appeals out to dry when they went to court. Okay, Ms. Newton. I don't have anything new. I guess Logo and Silverwood also. Okay, Ms. Arnley. They asked the staff to come up with a recommendation to change the city charter so that the city clerk's office reports to the city manager instead of to the mayor and council. And I don't like that. Mr. Person. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you have time. Oh, okay. Because if I want to come in to complain about the city manager or city staff, the city clerk is my avenue to complain. But if you make that change, then I'm going to be complaining about the city manager to the city manager's office. You know, that's we need some transparency there. Sorry. Okay, Mr. Pershaller. I'll go with uh, leaving the Board of Appeals out to dry, and I want to correct. We didn't ask them to come back with documents to change the city clerk. We asked them to come back with discussion points, and that's where it stands. Okay, Mr. Treha. <clears throat> the vote in secret session behind closed doors to change the name of East Middle Lane to um, Choice Hotel Boulevard. Okay, next, uh, so we're, we're going, I'm sorry, I apologize, Mr. Francis. I completely disagree with the Reed Brothers uh, Silverwood decision. Never should have happened, and if I get elected, I'll rescind it. For those of you who are incumbents running for re-election, that's obvious. Great question. Did you support building our much-needed new police headquarters in the historic old post office? Yes or no? I just I'll tell you what, let's change that. Oh. Whether or not you were an incumbent, okay, in, in that history, did you support um, building the police headquarters in the historic old post office? And I guess we start with Mr. Hall. Sure. Um, I do support that use for, uh, for that uh, uh, property. Uh, I do think that the price hike is a lot higher than, uh, than folks had uh, expected or uh, been uh, reasonably led to believe. Um, but I'm um, uh, I, that's an appropriate use for that property. I just think the uh, the terms are a little high. I think uh, public safety and the effective uh, operation of our police department absolutely requires that to be built. Ms. Newton? Uh, public safety is first and foremost, but I agree with John. I wish it wasn't so expensive. Ms. Honley? Uh, I support it. Um, I, as most of you know, my son is a police officer, so I do support it, but I think we're, we're going over in budget in spending for that. Okay. Mr. Pershala? I supported it. I was one of three people who supported the funding of it. Um, I don't think it's over budget. I think what's happened is that we've expanded what we're trying to do there. But that is for the future, 50, 60 years down the road. We've got a great price on the construction. We'll see it soon. <laughs> Mr. Trehan. Sorry. <clears throat> yes. Um, I would also call it Terry Treshick Hall because um, – in order to attract, I think, the best and the brightest, um, it's sort of like a football team. You don't want to go play at a bad stadium. And um, from what I understand, the police force, prior to Chief Treshick, um, was somewhat of uh, less than desirable. And he really turned uh, the city police force, not only a local and regional, but a nationally recognized um, organization. So, yes. Mr. Francis? Uh, I fully support the, the police department, the expansion. We have to give them the best facilities available if they are going to be our first responders, as they are, because the county is really uh, underrepresented in terms of being able to respond in a timely manner. If you call 911, you get Rockville there first. They have to have the best facilities possible. Okay, Mr. Gottfried. Uh, yes. Uh, where our city police are now in the basement of this uh, building is just not enough capacity. It's much needed and uh, much welcomed that they get uh, all the resources that they need to do their job. Okay, Mr. Hall. Did uh, we start uh, with you uh, first? Oh, you're the same, Mr. Hall. Okay. Yes. <laughs> right around. All right. Funny how things stay the same, isn't it? All right. Okay, I'm going to ask you to just answer yes or no on this because our time is up. All right. Do you think Pumphrey's funeral home should have been allowed to expand its parking lot? Let's. Uh, Let's see, we start with Mr. Moore, yes. Yes. Ms. Newton? Absolutely not. Ms. Onley? Yes. Mr. Pershala? Yes, and I voted for it. Mr. Trehan? No, and I'd vote against it. Okay. Yes. Mr. Francis says yes. Mr. No. Gary? Mr. No. Hall? No. Uh, I think we're about out of time at this point. We're ready for your closing statements. We will start at the other end of the line with Mr. Trehan. And you only have a minute, folks, so... Take a breath and uh, please give us your best.
Um, I'd like to see city pedestrian crossing have those chirping signs because um, the population is getting older, and I think visual impairments is a concern. Uh, I want to see local works in action. For example, like the sidewalk in Bell Elementary. Um, it took too long to get that thing built um, or constructed, but I'm glad it is in place. Uh, I want to see the services for seniors that provide nutritious meals at a discounted rate continue. Um, I also like to see uh, maybe twice a year where the city would have a couple buses and invite the citizens to take a tour of Rockville. Um, running, this came, uh, running for this position, I fell in love with Rockville all over again. I mean, I didn't even realize there was a man-made lake in the city. Um, and there's so many great eateries. Um, in Twinbrook, there's a little Swedish deli or um, bakery. It's delicious. Um, bottom line is I want you to believe in your city, and I want you to take your city back. That means having a city government that's inviting, that doesn't snicker, that doesn't tease you, make fun of you, berate you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Perschella. Yes, I feel I've had a strong first term, and the Gazette seems to agree. I got a very strong endorsement from the Gazette. I want to invite you to go, to, go up to my votepershela.org website. I claim on my palm card that I cut costs, improve the budget process, fix the zoning ordinance, champion neighborhood interests, support the Rockville businesses, advance environmental initiatives, and preserve our town center investment. If you want to get elaborations, it's on the website. But I also answer all questions on my website. There's about 50 now. Or people ask me questions, I answer them directly, and I put the answers and their questions without identifying on my website, so you know where I stand. Um, so I, I ask you to return me. We have challenges with budget sustainability, with preparing for an uncertain future. Gazette agrees that I'm the best qualified to lead the city in, that, in those realms, and in order to preserve your services and programs, we have to be thinking proactively while we have our economic strength. Thank you. Ms. Hunley. I also got an endorsement yesterday from the Gazette. They said Town Center resident Virginia Onley, 62, stands out as the most sincere. Onley, who lost, who, who was 408 votes shy of the seat on the city council in 2009, would bring a grassroots perspective and offer a voice for communities that have historically not been heard on the council. They also referenced my work with boards and commissions since 1994. They said, one caveat, she would have to have some heavy lifting to do to get up to speed on current city issues such as the APFO. And you know what? They're right. I don't know everything about running a city. I can tell you that I have sustained performances. I've worked for IBM and I've worked on boards. And, ca and commissions, and I will work hard for you. Please vote for me, Virginia Onley, on November 8th. Thank you. Ms. Newton. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Great questions. Um, as most of you know, I'm passionate about Rockville. I absolutely love our city. I believe we have a lot of potential, and I know we can do great things and go great places. Um, I'm a doer. I'm an idea person. Um, I, I saw a need for the grocery store, and the mayor and I went and met with Federal Realty, and we got the deal done, and in March we should have a new grocery in town center. Um, I saw a need for the youth to get involved after last time's campaign, and we started a youth commission. Um, we had a communications task force that had a development review subcommittee portion of it to make some changes to the way we do um, handle uh, the development process here in Rockville. Um, I, I would welcome a second term, and you can learn more about me at um, my website, but you can also call me. I'll always tell you the truth. I don't know any other way to be. Thank you. Mr. Moore. I'm proud to call Rockville my home and to be building my family in the West End and sending my Brady Bunch of six kids to our public schools. They give me great perspective on the issues that matter most to Rockville's families. Nobody has more at stake in the conditions of our schools than I do. I visited the homes of more than 2,000 voters in this election, and I try to make a point of asking people, do you have any issues with the city? And most times people say, no, I love living here. Rockville's a great town. And that's something I really try to keep in mind. We do live in a great city. We have terrific services and beautiful parks. Our government is managed professionally. Our public officials are honest and dedicated. And we're very lucky to have all that. But even though we, Rockville's a terrific city, we can do more and we can do better. We can be more accountable and transparent. We can listen to people better and we can explain ourselves better when we have to make an unpopular decision. We can, we can communicate better with the county, the state, the school system. We can protect our neighborhoods, but at the same time, plan for our future. I uh, would appreciate your vote on November 8th. My name is Tom Moore, 
My website is moreforrockville.com. Thank you. Mr. Hall. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to come out this evening, and especially want to thank our hosts, the Western Citizens Association, and Don, uh, for the great job that, uh, that you did. Um, we've discussed some important issues this evening. Um, we certainly haven't all agreed, um, but I'm hopeful that you will walk out of here feeling good about our city and our future. Um, we remain an economic engine for the region, uh, and that's something that I'm going to be working to preserve. Uh, I will restore uh, and, or work damn hard to do so uh, the homeowner's uh, tax rebate. Um, and I'm also going to be holding the line on taxes without increasing anyone's tax rate, but simply by reducing turnover and building up the commercial tax base, um, I think we can really achieve uh, a sensible budget that adheres to our principles of fiscal responsibility and also our values. I will ensure that the APFO is preserved, which gives us a critical tool in managing growth in Rockville and ensuring that development complements our community and doesn't overwhelm our infrastructure or overburden our schools. I thank you again for coming out, and I wish you all well. Mr. Gottfried. Thank you to the West End Citizens Association for organizing this CAD forum. forum. Again, I'm endorsed by the FOP Lodge 117. In the current financial climate, every decision should be well thought out. The chief objective of a good city council is to safeguard our important community assets, our schools, services, and parks. Proving a realistic budget that serves the public good is an integral part of a councilman's responsibilities. With your vote, I will protect our schools from overcrowding, our police and public services from being overburned by keeping our APFO strong. I will advocate for intelligent and realistic plans for future growth in the West End, in Town Center, and on Rockville Pike. I will preserve Rockville's parks and open space. I will use my financial expertise to carefully analyze the budget and provide responsible fiscal management. I will provide open, responsive, and accountable government that will encourage and value citizen input. I will be honored by your vote on November 8th. You can visit my campaign website at www.godfreedforcouncil.org or call me at 301-762-5182. Vote Godfrey for a good government. Mr. Francis. Uh, yes, uh, there's a need for new, fresh ideas. The old, tired ideas have dug a tremendous hole for the city with this huge financial burden that we have taken on. Uh, I'm proposing a new approach. I'm a pro a proposing getting the tax burden off the back of the homeowners. Seventy percent of the residents are paying 100 percent of the taxes to run the city. That's wrong. By changing from a property-based tax to an income-based income tax, we will increase the tax base, get more revenue to run the city, and create a more progressive, not regressive way of getting money to run the city. Everybody should be paying their fair share of taxes to run the city. That is not the case at the present time. This is a new idea. It should be given an opportunity to be successful. Many other cities are operating exactly the same way. Thank you. I also want to thank the Fraternal Order of Police again for giving me their endorsement for the council seat. Uh, we will turn this over to Susan Prince, the president of WICA, and I just want to express thanks to the candidates for a moment and to you in the audience. You submitted many questions. I'm sorry I did not uh, get them all in. I tried to synthesize some of them, those that I could read. And here's Susan. Thank you, Don. I'd like to ask everybody to give our candidates a round of applause. Thank you. And also Don, who did an admirable job moderating. Thank you. I just want to take two seconds to remind everybody. First, I wanted to thank all of the volunteers that helped make this possible. I did not do this alone. I could not. Um, Jack Jellen was very helpful in helping us to accumulate all the various questions. Sarah Prince, my daughter, who was subbing at the last minute because our timekeeper took ill today. So Rose Sharkey has been very, very helpful as well in keeping us all together. And then Sabrina Dawson, who has been so nice to collect the questions. So thank you, everybody. Um, you know, it's late. You guys uh, hung in there. It was kind of a little bit of an uh, interesting night for all of us. And I just want to remind everybody to vote, no matter who you're supporting. And just to echo Don's sentiments, we did get so many questions. We got so many really good questions. I urge each of you to email the candidates. Don't rely only on a public forum to get answers. You're perfectly free to email them and ask. If your question didn't get asked tonight, Email them and see if you can um, get your questions answered. Thanks again. Good night.